Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. My name is Emily Whitehouse and I'm an Associate Director of Admissions at the Yale School of Management, overseeing admissions for the master's degree program in asset management. I'm so excited to have such excellent turnout for today's master class and that we're joined not only by so many prospective asset management students, but also those interested in degree programs across SOM. Some of our current students at SOM are joining the call today too. So welcome everyone. I'll start with a brief introduction. The topic of today's class is quality and defensive investing. During Professor Moskowitz's presentation, I ask that you please submit your questions through the Q&A function in Zoom. I'm joined by Program Director Arwen Zeisler. Good morning, Arwen. Morning, Emily. Uh, welcome to all of you who took the time to join us today and we're uh, looking forward and hope you enjoy today's presentation. Arwen and I will be reviewing questions during and following the presentation with Arwen asking as many of your questions as possible during the Q&A portion of today's program. I'd first like to welcome Professor Tobias Moskowitz, Dean Takahashi Professor of Finance at Yale School of Management. Professor Moskowitz also serves as the co-chair of the master's degree program in asset management and as principal at AQR Capital Management. Good morning, Toby. So great to be with you and thank you so much for making time for us today. Of course, thanks for having me. All right, without further ado, Toby, I'll turn it over to you for a quick introduction and so that we can get started and roll right into Q&A as soon as possible. Sounds good. Thanks, Emily. Thanks for organizing this and thanks everyone for joining uh, us this morning or this evening or this afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I, I'm Toby Moskowitz. Uh, I teach a course on quantitative investing uh, here at Yale and also, um, which uh, uh, is currently going on in fact right now. Um, and I also um, am, as Emily mentioned, I'm a principal at AQR Capital Management where, um, you know, I do the same thing basically. So, you know, most days it's one job just in two locations. Occasionally it feels like two jobs. But uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about today and give you a sense of what we're trying to do in the master's program. And, and as Emily mentioned, I am the academic uh, head of the program and design the curriculum in close collaboration with David Swenson, uh, the Yale uh, Investment Office. Um, and one of the things that uh, we tried to do was bring in the real world practice of finance and combine it with the academic work. So a lot of what I teach in my quant course are quant methods, a lot of which came from academia, but are applied in practice. Uh, we use it at AQR, uh, for instance, and I bring that to the classroom. I'm going to talk about one of those topics today, quality and defensive investing. But it's also the case that, that David and other uh, people that he works with and some of his investors will bring in their firm specific knowledge into the classroom as well. And not all of them are quantitative. So uh, I know many of you are probably interested in quantitative finance, but we plan on exposing you to all aspects of investing, not just the quant side, but the fundamental discretion side as well um, and all different aspects and all different asset classes. Today though, I'm gonna focus just on a, a a small piece of a lecture I gave several weeks ago in my class on quality and, de and defensive investing to give you a sense of at least what, you know, some of the things I do in my course and, and what this will look like. So let me start with uh, just some quick uh, overview of, of what I'm gonna try to cover. And as usual, I have a half hour and I'm trying to cover like an hour's worth of material. So uh, those of you that will end up taking my class will see that that's typically the case, but that's okay. If we don't get through everything, we don't get through everything. So let me start with some definitions. What is quality? What is defensive investing? And there's many definitions here. There's also a really nice connection between quality investing and value investing. And by the way, for those of you that are thinking about this program and think, I don't know what he's talking about. I've never heard of value investing. I've never heard of quality investing. That's fine. I'm just trying to give you a sense of what I do in class. I don't expect you to understand every piece of jargon I use here. I'll try to explain some of it, of course, but you know, it's okay if you don't know what the Fahman French model is, for instance. That's what you're coming here for, presumably. So I'm gonna start by talking about quality investing and value investing, and I will define those and how they're related and talk about a few aspects of this, including a very uh, interesting and old story that is the backbone of one of the most popular quantitative trading strategies in the last decade, something called betting against beta, which I'll talk about shortly. And then at the end, and I, I'm, I'll make sure I get there, I want to look at probably the most famous investor of all time, Warren Buffett, and see if we can explain his performance and understand it. And, and I'll come back to what I mean by that uh, at the end. 
So let me start with just two quick definitions. Quality investing, simple, simple concept. This is the thing that people often get wrong about quantitative investing. They think that you know quants make things super sophisticated and complicated with lots of math and statistics. We don't try to make it sophisticated. We use sophisticated math and statistical techniques to answer questions, but the concepts themselves are incredibly simple and intuitive. For instance, quality investing, very simply put, is something you're willing to pay a high price for, all else equal. Couldn't be a simpler concept, something that you value. So what are some examples? Well, what kinds of stocks, what kinds of firms do we think are high quality? They would be profitable, safe, have good governance, good growth prospects, maybe have high payout, be credit worthy, maybe they're well managed. Maybe they also engage in things we care about socially or environmentally, things that we're willing to pay a high price for because we think those are good quality firms, okay? Now, then there's also value investing. And value investing is really more about the price. It's a firm that's trading at a discount that looks cheap relative to some fundamental value. And we measure this by looking at some ratio of fundamental worth like book value to its market value, its price or earnings to price or cash flow to price. And these two concepts are different, but also related. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So you can think of value investing as buying something that's cheap, that's discounted below its fair market value. Typically value stocks are not great stocks, but they're selling at great prices. They're sort of like okay stocks that are selling at great prices. Those are good investment opportunities. Quality is kind of the, the other side of the coin, which is these are really high quality firms, but they're high quality firms you're not paying a premium price for. So the idea here is you wanna buy really deep discounted stocks that are not as bad as the market thinks, and you also wanna buy really high quality stocks that aren't as expensive as they should be, right? In both cases, you're getting a discount there. Now, an empirical question is, do we see this in the data? Is there a quality premium when you look at this in the data? Is there a value premium when you look at this in the data? And a big part of what quants do, my world, is what we call backtesting, looking through historical data and confirming our thesis by running tests as if we were running real money in real time, what we call a backtest. Okay? And there's all kinds of issues with back tests that if you take my class, uh, we'll get into. Now, answering this question is important from a market efficiency standpoint, because if markets are perfectly efficient, well, none of this stuff is going to predict returns at all, unless it's tied to some notion of risk. So there's also sort of a deeper theoretical test in the background going on here, too, which I, I won't get into today. Okay, now, this idea of quality and value it's startlingly obvious on the street. It goes all the way back to Benjamin Graham, one of the mentors of Warren Buffett back in the 1930s, um, which was, yeah, buy cheap assets or buy you know, quality assets at a good price. This seems like a very, very good deal. It was less obvious to academics, precisely because markets are pretty efficient, we thought. And so it's hard to believe that this stuff would predict returns. But the central question here is how do you, how do you measure this stuff? How is it best to measure this? Um, and a lot of this stuff is, is an alternative to, to growth measures. Quality, you can think of as a better way to capture growth because you're taking into account the price you pay for it, okay? And a big question here is, can this be implemented in a systematic and quantitative way? There's a lot of discretionary managers out there who, sure, they try to buy cheap stocks or high quality stocks. You hear people talk about this in the private equity industry, for instance, but can you implement this kind of concept in a, in a systematic quantitative way. And what I mean by that is, you know, like some of the things we do at AQR, we will apply this concept not just to, you know, a, a handful or several dozen stocks or even hundreds, but we're talking about thousands, tens of thousands of stocks globally. Can you apply this kind of process in that systematic fashion, fashion across so many different securities? And I'm going to argue, yes, you can. So here's some of the early evidence. This comes from a great paper by Robert Novi Marks who uh, was at the University of Chicago with me at the time, um, is now at the University of Rochester. He did a very simple exercise, and again, a systematic exercise, where this is the standard in academic research. You rank stocks based on some characteristic, in this case, book-to-market ratios, and also gross profitability, okay? uh, gross profit margins uh, of firms, and gross profits over assets. And then what you do is you rank them and put them into five groups, kind of the lowest quintile to the highest quintile. So these are your most expensive stocks, and these are your cheapest stocks, high book to market, low book to market, and then everything in between. And um, then if you look at uh, 
the uh, profit, oh, sorry, this is profitability, sorry, low profitability to high profitability. And down here is, and going down here is low book to market to high book to market. So these are your cheap stocks, these are your expensive stocks, these are your high profit stocks, and these are your low profit stocks. And you're looking at the intersection between these two pieces. And what's nice about this is that by sum up, if I take the high minus low across these rows, I'm getting a spread between highly profitable firms and low profitable firms in terms of their future returns. So just so everyone's clear, you rank today on say profitability or book to price, and then you form a portfolio and then you look at the returns over the next year out of sample. Everything has to be out of sample because you're trying to predict returns. There's no cheating here. You don't get to see the future. So what you're seeing here is that if I look at firms that were highly profitable last year, and compare them to firms that were not very profitable last year, and I invest in those, go long the high ones and short the low ones, I earn a premium of about 64 basis points or 0.64% per, per month on, those, uh, on that spread with a T statistic here of three and a half. And those of you that need a brush up on statistics, that means you can reject, it's not zero. Um, easily reject it, it has to be above two basically for you to conclude that. And you can see that that's true for every single row here, that there's a big profitability or quality premium uh, within each book to market category. So whether you're talking about cheap firms or, or sorry, expensive firms or cheap firms, going long high profitable firms and short low profitable firms is very profitable. And this other stuff out here is just controlling for other known effects, like what's going on in the market, whether there's a small or large cap bias, and also controlling for value itself if this wasn't a good control. And then if you sum up the information in each column, going long the high book to market stocks and short the low book to market stocks, but doing that within each profitability category, you also get a very healthy value premium that long the cheap stocks, short the expensive stocks produces abnormal returns or, or a positive premium here, again, with T statistics way above two, and it's not explained by these other things in the economy. And what's really interesting here is that if you add up these two highlighted places, you can see that there's a, the mean profitability spread, if I take the average of these, is about 58 basis points per month. And that's a lot bigger than the unconditional spread of profitability, which is normally half that. And that's because if I control for how cheap or expensive stocks are, the premium on profitability gets even larger, it doubles. So one way of saying this is, you're better off going uh, long high quality and short low quality stocks if you control for how cheap or expensive they are. And that's kind of the concept that quality has, which is buy a great, a great company at a fair price. Controlling for the price, how cheap or expensive it is, quality gives you a big predictability in returns. By the way, the converse is also true. Controlling for quality, Getting cheaper assets gives you a big premium as well. The value spread is 68 basis points per month, and that's also twice as good as it normally is if you don't control for quality. So what's nice about this is controlling for value or, or cheapness, quality gives you twice the premium, and controlling for quality, value gives you twice the premium, while combining them works even better. So here's a quick summary stat sheet on a strategy that is long value and quality simultaneously. In other words, taking advantage of both of these concepts. I wanna buy cheap assets, controlling for how profitable they are, and I wanna buy profitable assets, controlling for how cheap they are. And combining those two things gives me active returns with big T stats of like three to 4% per year, um, with T stats of like five, and an information ratio, which is like a sharp ratio once you account for market risk, of like 0.65 or 0.8. And just to give you a sense of how that compares, the equity market as a whole has a sharp ratio of about 0.4 or 0.35. So these are about double the sharp ratio of just the simple equity market portfolio. And if you really want to um, lever this up, you can not only go long quality and long value stocks, you could also short the expensive and the low quality stocks, and then you can get an even bigger effect um, that's market neutral where you get a big sharp ratio of about 0.8 and a very healthy premium of about 8%, okay? at least among small cap and about 6% among large cap. So this is something that has enticed 
quantitative money managers like AQR for more than a decade. We've been running money on this, I think maybe about 12 years or more uh, on this concept. Certainly value goes back to our roots, but on um, value and quality for, for quite some time. And we do it in both long, short, as well as long only context, depending on what our investors want. Another quick way to see the benefits of combining these two things is this chart right here. You can see these are the returns, okay, over time of uh, profitability, of value in the, in the very faint dashed line here, and then the 50-50 mix of the two, which gives you a lot better and a lot smoother ride. Notice that when value does terrible, quality usually offsets it. And when quality does terrible, value usually offsets it to a certain extent. So the combination of the two is very, very powerful. And this is one of the concepts that we exploit in quantitative finance in my class, as well as at AQR, which is this is the sheer power of diversification. And you see it here quite clearly with just two simple concepts, value and quality. Okay. So by the way, those simple concepts, value and quality, explain a whole lot of what people do on Wall Street. And they talk about it as if it's different. It's not. So going back to, to Benjamin Graham, they had a list of seven things they looked at that were important for investing. And you can see them right here. I'm not going to spend time reading them. But all these different things, they're just different versions of value and quality. I can summarize everything they do in just those two simple concepts. Same with what they do at GMO and MSCI with low leverage, high profitability, and low earnings volatility. Or Joel Greenblatt's little book that beats the market, which he you know, uh, calls his magic formula. Maybe a bit arrogant, but it's nothing more than value and quality. And we know that works. This is similar to what we do at AQR or BlackRock does or Morgan Stanley does with some accounting professors, uh, namely Joe Piotrowski, who I know at Stanford. All of these different measures that people call and give their own names to, they're really just different versions of value and quality. And it's a very powerful concept, okay? And the backbone of a lot of investing strategies. Now, one interesting aspect of quality, another aspect of quality is not just profitability. You can measure it in lots of different ways. And another way to think about a high quality asset is safety. And this, uh, I, this is a paper by Two of my colleagues I work with at AQR, although they were colleagues in different ways, Andrea Frazzini was uh, a colleague of mine at the University of Chicago and now runs all of the global uh, equity strategies at AQR. And Lasse Pedersen is a professor at NYU in Copenhagen. Um, and they wrote this cool paper called Betting Against Beta, two papers actually, and Embedded Leverage, which is, it takes an old idea from 40 uh, years ago and re 50 years ago almost, and recast it into the, one of the most popular um, quant trading strategies today. And it's an element of quality, which is what I want to talk about. It's called defensive investing. So let me start with a, with a quick historical overview of where this concept came from. This dates all the way back to the very famous economist Fisher Black. And I don't know how many of you know that name, but he was one of the co-authors of the famous Black-Scholes option pricing model. Uh, would have won the Nobel Prize, but he died of cancer in 1996, and the Nobel Prize was given for his work in 1997 to Myron Scholes and, and Bob Merton. But Fisher Black was an incredibly creative and great thinker, and he was actually part of the first, so I don't know how many of you know this, but before Vanguard and before anything else, uh, Wells Fargo was the, was the first to really come up with the concept of an index fund. They were going to create a market portfolio that investors could uh, invest in. And they had a big meeting, and there were a bunch of academics consulting for them and a bunch of what would become famous uh, money managers working for Wells Fargo at the time. And this list over here is the attendance sheet of this meeting that happened in 1969, and it's kind of the who's who of finance. You've got a couple Nobel laureates on this list. There's Myron Scholes and Fisher Black. I think Bob Merton's on here, too. You also have some of the early uh, starters of Vanguard. You have David Booth from Dimensional Fund Advisors. Uh, Wayne Winston, actually, who started the Plexus Group, he's the one that gave us this. This was in the, it gave uh, Andre and Lasse this. It was in his basement, uh, <laughs> and he happened to see a presentation and said, "I've got something for you." And there was this, apparently there was a meeting about how to construct the first market index. And Fisher Black was adamant that you shouldn't actually create it to match the, a beta of one on the market. In fact, what you should do is tilt towards low beta stocks and away from high beta stocks. He was voted out. Uh, everyone said, we're not doing that. And apparently it was one of the few times he got upset and, and huffed out of the room. And why was Fisher Black wanting to do something different from the market when the whole idea was to create an index fund that mimicked the market? Well, here's why. Those of you who haven't seen this before, 
don't worry, you'll get this. Those of you that may have seen this in, in, in an undergraduate uh, investments course or something, um, that's fine. But you don't have to know what this, basically, if you look at the trade-off of expected return versus risk, which is a concept we focus on in investing, we have a theory that says, well, if you summarize all the investment opportunities out there and you're just talking about mean and standard deviation as the two concepts that you're worried about, you get what's called, you get a parabola of investment opportunities. And that's just what works out from the math. Okay. And then when you have a riskless asset, what happens is you basically create a line between this parabola, this curve and the Y axis. This is a risk-free asset, so no risk. And you invest somewhere along this line, something called the capital allocation line. Okay. And this line of course is tangent. It's the, it's the line that gives you the steepest slope to this parabola. And for those of you that really are paying attention, the, uh, what's the slope of this line? The slope of this line is something called a sharp ratio. So you want the line that gives you the steepest slope. You could have driven, driven, could have drawn a line right here, but that would have a lower sharp ratio. So you can take the one that's tangent. Okay, now, again, why is this important? All it says is that no matter where you are as an investor, if you want to be here, you're better off being up here. And how do you get up here? you basically invest in this portfolio and lever it up by borrowing. And that gets you to this point here. And that's better than not borrowing and staying right here because this gives you notice, higher return at lower risk than this right here. Okay, that's the idea. And what Fisher Black noticed was, yeah, that sounds great in theory, but that assumes everybody can borrow at the risk-free rate freely. And we know that's not true, okay? In fact, a lot of firms and a lot of individuals for sure can't borrow freely. In fact, a lot of pension funds are restricted from borrowing. Their boards won't let them. They, they're, this, this, they have a leverage cost, either it's a self-imposed cost or even a psychological cost that they won't use it. So if that's the case, the actual borrowing rate isn't here, it's up here. And in that case then, instead of this portfolio being the market portfolio that everybody should invest in, it ends up being out here. When you have a set of leverage constrained investors, these two things are no longer the same. So what does that mean? It means that if we think about market beta and its relation to expected returns, which is a theory that comes from something called the capital asset pricing model, we should get a steep 45 degree line right here in red. But in fact, if people can't borrow very easily, what's gonna happen? Well, they're gonna overpay for high beta stocks because they need more risk. They're going to underpay, they're going to undervalue low beta stocks, and you get a much flatter line that looks like this. The idea is pretty simple. If I create a portfolio that has a brilliant sharp ratio, but it's on 1% volatility, and let's say the sharp ratio is a 2, then I can only earn 2% return on that. And that might be a great sharp ratio, but as we say in, in, in practice, you can't eat sharp ratios. If you're an endowment or a pension fund and you have an 8% rate that you need to target to meet your obligations, 2% isn't going to get you there. Now, what theory tells us is lever it up four to one. If I lever it up four times, I can get to 8%. But if I can't use leverage, that 2% does nothing for me. So instead, what I'll do is I'll forego a better sharp ratio and I'll take a lower sharp ratio, but one that takes on more risk that gets me to that 8% target. And that's what's happening here. You will overpay for high beta stocks that get you that risk and underpay, you'll avoid the low beta stocks because they can't move the dial for you enough. Now, that's in theory. What does the data say? Fisher Black ran the data back in 1972 and found exactly what you would expect consistent with his theory. Low beta stocks are underpriced. They have higher expected returns than they should. High beta stocks are overpriced. They have lower expected returns than they should. This was in 1972. Fisher was voted out uh, of that Wells Fargo discussion, and the idea never got implemented. Fast forward 40 years later, and Frazzini and Peterson pick up the same idea and think, you know what, that was a good idea. Let's, let's re-examine that and take a look. And lo and behold, they re-estimated the same thing that Fisher Black did, only now they're using data from 1926 to 2010, and they find exactly the same thing. In fact, it's even stronger. High beta stocks, very overvalued, have low expected returns, low beta stocks undervalued have high expected returns, much more so than the simple beta expected return paradigm suggests, okay? So what does that mean you should do? It means 
that if you can use leverage, if you're a firm like AQR and you can use leverage and, and other people can't, then you should take the other side of this bet. If people are overvaluing high beta stocks, great, we'll sell them to you. And if they're undervaluing low beta stocks, great, we'll buy them from you and we'll use leverage and lever it up. If you can't do it, we'll take the other side of that, do it for you and charge a fee. And that has been a huge business for us and other people who have done this, BlackRock too, many other firms, uh, especially coming out of the global financial crisis. Okay? And it's been, a, it's been a huge winner in the, in the last decade. And you can see the evidence on this. If I do that, if I look at high beta stocks versus low beta stocks and look at their risk adjusted returns, low beta stocks outperform high beta stocks. Look, you can see how monotonic it is in US stocks. Here it is globally. It even works, by the way, not just in stocks. You can do this in treasury bonds, credit indices, uh, credit default swaps, corporate debt, uh, equity indices across the world, commodities, and even country bonds. It works pretty much everywhere you, you, would ever, you could ever test it. Okay? And it gives you very nice performance. Uh, looking at all these different markets, even inter international markets one by one, you get a very nice sharp ratio that is if as good, if not better than most other quantitative strategies as well, like value, momentum, and size. And of course, what we say in, in, in both my class and in the quantitative world is you're not looking at this versus these, you're going to combine all of these together. And that's going to be the, the basis of your quant model. All right. Finally, um, in terms of the last uh, topic, we can also see if this theory makes any sense. And in particular, the idea here is the reason these defensive, so it's called a defensive strategy because you're buying low volatility or low beta stocks and you're shorting high volatility, high beta stocks, and you're making money while doing it. It seems too good to be true. I get to buy something safer and earn a premium for, for doing so, um, a risk adjusted premium. But the premise of this is that investors are leverage constrained. So let's see if that's the case. So if you take a look, for instance, at mutual funds and individual investors, these are investors who are leverage constrained. Mutual funds, for instance, many of their prospectuses and charters prevent them from using a lot of leverage, either direct borrowing or even using derivative securities to get that leverage exposure. Individual investors find leverage expensive. We don't have the same borrowing capacity of a large institution or firm. So if that's the case, if these are leverage constrained investors, then on average, these types of investors should be holding stocks that have higher betas, betas greater than one. And here's the evidence, here's the proof. If you look at the average mutual fund manager, they hold stocks that have significantly higher betas above one, okay? Same with individual investors. And this comes from a large discount brokerage firm, all right? Take the other side of that. Investors who can use leverage and use it very cheaply, um, they should be holding very low beta stocks and adopting this strategy. Well, take a look at leverage buyout firms. By definition, those firms use a lot of leverage. And in fact, they use leverage to great effect. They buy extremely low beta assets and then lever them up. That's exactly what LBOs do in, in the private equity world. And then take Warren Buffett himself. Even though Warren Buffett has said many things publicly about the evils of leverage, he's the biggest leverage user in the world. Uh, I guess it's a little bit of do as I say, not as I do. Um, but he's doing the right thing from an investment standpoint buying low beta stocks, and you can see the average stock that Berkshire Hathaway owns are very low beta, and then he levers them like crazy. He uses his insurance business, in fact, to get very, very cheap leverage, maybe some of the cheapest in the world. That's an excellent strategy. And so just to wrap up, let's take this concept of value and quality investing and just see how much of it could explain Warren Buffett's performance. Warren Buffett is always hailed as the guru of stock market picking. He holds a very concentrated portfolio of like 15 stocks and everyone heralds him as his great stock picker. I don't think he's a good stock picker at all, or at least I don't think the evidence is consistent with that. I think he may, had a brilliant strategy related to quality and value investing. And it's those concepts more than the individual stocks that he picks that I think drive, drive his performance. And let's see if I can show you that that's what's going on. This comes from a nice paper by Frazzini, Kabiller and Pedersen known as Buffett's Alpha. And what they do is a very simple decomposition of Warren Buffett's incredible historical performance, okay? And what, uh, what they do is they, first of all, they take a look at Berkshire Hathaway stock, 
It's comprised of assets and liabilities. And there's really two big assets, take out cash for the moment, that uh, Berkshire invests in. It's the publicly traded equities that Buffett buys, as well as privately held companies. Okay? And if you do a little, de we can't get data on the privately held companies, but we can get data on the publicly traded equities that Berkshire holds. These are filed by the, to the SEC under 13F filings, and you can get a snapshot of this. Plus, we also know that Berkshire is traded publicly, so we can approximate what the value of the public holdings are, compare that to the stock value of Berkshire, and then the residual that's left over has to be approximately what the private equity holdings are worth. Okay, so it's kind of clever how they go about backing this out. And here's just a little bit of the math and accounting that allows you to do that, okay? All right, so, um, so again, we take Berkshire equity stock, we approximate the value of the publicly traded companies from public records at the SEC, and then the difference between those has to be roughly what the privately held companies are worth. And then what's cool about this is you can take the value historically over time of the public side of Buffett's investments, the private side, and see how much you can explain it by using, these are Fama French factors, you don't have to know what those are, but basically you have the market, you have size, you have a value factor, momentum, topic for another day, and then you have quality and defensive right here, betting against beta, and then a quality minus junk type of index. And what you can see here is if you look at Berkshire stock from 1976 to 2011 as a huge alpha over the market size and value, okay, and momentum, but as soon as you add quality and defensive, that alpha gets cut in half and is no longer statistically significant. In other words, you can explain a huge chunk of Warren Buffett's performance just by these concepts of value and quality, okay? If you look at the publicly traded stock, you can explain all of his performance from value and quality. There's no alpha at all. It goes from 5.3% to 0.3% per year once you adjust for those things. So Warren Buffett isn't a great stock picker. What he is great at is recognizing that value and quality investing are really good ideas, and he's been doing them for a long time before anybody else. That's what I give Warren Buffett credit for, not necessarily his ability to pick this stock versus this stock. It's really a concept of applying value and quality. And you see it right here. And then sure, for the private holdings, you can only explain a little bit. And that's because on the private equity side, I think Buffett probably does add value as a CEO and how to run these companies better. That is a specific skill, okay? And just to kind of add this all up, you might say, really, can you just explain the greatest investor of all time's performance that's just these two simple concepts of value and quality? Well, if I were, you know, Warren Buffett amassed what? $85 billion in wealth, right? Investing for over 60 years. Any guesses as to, well, there's too many people to ask this, but I always ask my class, if you had to guess what Warren Buffett's sharp ratio is, what would you think it is? Knowing that the market sharp ratio is about 0.4, obviously he did better than that. Um, thinking about some of these famous hedge fund managers that have these big sharp ratios, most people say that, well, Buffett's sharp ratio has to be, I don't know, at least two or more, okay? Certainly above one, they would say. Turns out Warren Buffett's sharp ratio is only 0.6 slightly better than the market, okay? And 0.6 is exactly what you get if you just combined in a systematic way the concepts of quality and value. And here's an example. The, the orange here is the overall stock market, the growth of a dollar over, you know, uh, 40 years. The green is Berkshire Hathaway's uh, public stock from the 13F filings, okay, which did obviously better than the market. And the blue is replicating Buffett's portfolio, not with the actual stocks that he picked, but just by using an index of value and quality and holding on for 40 years. That's it. That will get you $85 billion. Now here's the, quick, here's the trick though. You have to be able to hold on. You have to be able to live through this and live through this. And those of you that know what's going on in markets, live through the current situation. Value is doing terrible right now, but if you can live through that, over time you get rewarded. Okay? And so give Buffett credit, but give him credit where he's earned it, which is understanding value and quality and defensive investing were great ideas and applying and sticking with them for 60 plus years. That's what he did. What he's not, what you shouldn't give him credit for as much is it's not about individual stock picking. Uh, it's really about these concepts of quality and value investing. 
So I'm going to stop there because I think I'm, I'm probably two minutes over what I was going to do. Um, and uh, we will open it up and see if there's uh, any, any questions. So I'll go back to the uh, title slide here just to keep it some background. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Toby, very much. That was a wonderful presentation and hopefully was informative for the, uh, looks like we have almost 500 participants watching, which is wonderful to hear. Uh, so since we do have some time, about uh, 25, 20 to 25 minutes or so, I did want to take the chance to ask you some of the, the great questions that we've gotten. And we've gotten some really wonderful questions that have streamed in uh, through your presentation. And so the, the first question that I'd like to begin with uh, focusing on the first half of your presentation. So why do you think that there's both a quality and a value premium in the markets? You know, you might think as these as two sides of the opposite coin. So is there a theory or a story that could give rise to both of these premiums existing? So you know, that's a great question. And it's one that academics are struggling with. Um, you know, everybody has their has their particular theories. Uh, for instance, you know, Fama and French, the, the famous uh, financial economists, have always argued that the value premium is really compensation for distress risk. Uh, so firms that are value stocks, that are cheap stocks, they're uh, in financial distress usually, and there's investors that don't want to face that risk. And so uh, that stock, in order to induce investors to uh, invest, has to offer a premium. That's kind of the general sort of efficient markets theory of why there's value investing. Um, that theory might work for value, but that theory has a really difficult time explaining why you see quality at the same time, because quality stocks are the opposite. They're safe stocks. <laughs> They're profitable firms. They're not distressed, and yet they carry a premium. So I think you know what the academic world is struggling with is, can you find one theory that fits both of these facts? And I would argue, no, it's been very difficult to do. Now, what that means is maybe maybe you need two concepts, two different theories. Uh, quality might be driven by some other notion of risk that we haven't really thought of, but it's a risk that seems to be partially offset by value and vice versa. So I think what's really difficult to explain here is when you combine both the concepts of quality and value investing at the same time, it's hard to find one story that can fit both of those facts. That's on the risk side. On the behavioral side, where you think that maybe value stocks are just underpriced and, and mispriced by the market and quality stocks are too, you also face a little bit of the same problem, which is value stocks may be neglected firms, but high quality firms shouldn't be neglected. So why are they underpriced? And again, it's hard to find a single theory that can explain both of those facts simultaneously. There are some, my, my famous colleague here at Yale, Nick Barbaris, who by the way, teaches in this program, a behavioral finance course. He also runs the National Bureau of Economic Research and Behavioral um, Research. So, you know, he's certainly a big name. He's got a number of recent papers that are trying to reconcile this from a behavioral perspective. Um, and I think he's getting closer to a, a reasonable story, um, but still not quite there. So this is something that, that people grapple with. And it's also why, you know, one of the things that we focus on in the quant world and in my research is, again, you can find stories that fit one factor at a time, but when you start putting all these factors together, it becomes much tougher to come up with a coherent story that can explain all these facts. And so I think quality and defensive are probably two of the most troubling facts that are hard to reconcile simultaneously because they offset each other's risks. And so that makes it difficult to explain why it commands such a big premium in markets. And so, you know, another way of saying this is, the reason hedge funds and quants are so interested in this combination, as well as people like Warren Buffett, is precisely because it's hard to explain and make it go away. It, it offers such a rich uh, predictive uh, framework for returns, um, which is really great. So that was a long-winded way of me saying I don't know. <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have that answer today, uh, but it's certainly a very, very good topic and good question. Well, and it's, it's, uh, it makes a good point for our listeners today that there's there's still a lot of work and a lot of research opportunities that are open uh, to, to future finance students. Absolutely. So another, in fact, one of the, well, I was gonna say, another thing that I always say to the students is, you know, my job in class, and, and I think Dave, David Swenson and I agree on this completely, which is our job in this program is to teach you skills and tools and ways of thinking. It's not to tell you, here's what you need to do to build the model. It, it consists of these several elements. No, we want to change the way you think about these things, because the, to be honest, 
10 years from now, when you're in the middle of your career, um, the facts may change. There are going to be different factors. There are going to be different things out there, but how you approach them needs, needs to be the same. So I think that's why there are lots of unanswered questions. And these questions may be unanswered for a long time, but it's, we don't have all the answers and that's not the purpose. It's to change the way you think about these things. So anyway, please go ahead, Arwen. Sorry about oh, that. Exactly. Exactly. So do you think that there is a, a best measure of value and quality? Do you think, for example, is it the, the measures of value and quality on the, the slide that you had in your presentation from that particular paper? Or do you think that there's perhaps a better way of measuring value and uh, measuring quality? Well, this in some sense is what a lot of firms try to differentiate themselves on, which is we, we all agree that value and quality are great concepts, but we have a better way of measuring it, right? And, and at AQR, we do the same thing. Um, I can talk a little bit about the work I've done with AQR, which is, you know, the way we approach it is there, you know, unless you have a really strong theoretical reason that one measure should be better than the other, your best approach is a robust system, meaning we would take half a dozen quality or more, let's say a dozen quality measures and, and a dozen value measures and weight them equally, taking an average of all of them because there's noise in accounting data. There's noise in different measures. There's nuances to these different things. And by taking an average of these things, um, we feel we have a more robust system. And the reason we do that is because it's always dangerous if you don't have any theory or any guidance to say, I'm just going to pick the one that did the best historically. Because often what ends up happening is you end up overfitting. And what I mean by that is you end up fitting noise rather than signal. You have, maybe you just got lucky in that period that that happened to do the best, but there's no evidence that it will do the best going forward. And typically what you find is it doesn't. Um, now, having said that, there are some obvious things that you can do to improve the measures. For instance, one of the innovations that AQR is famous for is we industry adjust a lot of these measures, recognizing that what's cheap in one industry might mean something very different than another industry because accounting uh, numbers mean different things in different industries. So there's some economically intuitive concepts that help you clean up these measures. Or for instance, you know, thinking about, well, when you think about book value, it's not just the tangible assets, but thinking of the intangible assets and adjusting for that and doing all kinds of other different things that economically make sense and are guided by theory. That's the way we approach it and then take an average of those things. But for sure, firms disagree on this. You know, uh, Two Sigma might say, we, have, we, we use the concept of value, but we think we measure it better than anybody else. And, and then they'll be very secretive about how they measure it. And maybe they're right. Maybe they know how to measure this better than others. And so that's where some of the competition comes from is thinking about these. But I don't know of any one right measure um, because it really has to come from theory to think about why that's the right measure. But I can think of lots of good ideas to clean up these measures. And those are things that people have done o over time. And with, by the way, with big data, um, there's lots of other ways to measure these things too. Even the concept of an industry has now changed. It used to be SIC codes or Nike's codes. You can measure industries, you know, fluidly now by looking at, um, you know, links between firms and all kinds of big data type issues. And that's interesting because, you know, you can think of take AQR, our competitor on the product side might be another hedge fund like Bridgewater, but on the labor side, we don't just compete with Bridgewater. We also compete with Google and Facebook. The talent that we're trying to hire, they have offers at all these other tech firms, not just financial firms. So the connections between firms have changed dramatically over time too. Those are other things you take into account. But these, these are the gory details and so what makes it fun. Uh, exactly, exactly. So obviously your presentation, you focused on quality and value, but do you think that there's other factors, uh, the size factor, momentum factor that you could add to the framework? to achieve you know, oh. even a better multi-factor exposure. And, and one particular question that, uh, that we received is, what are your thoughts, if you're thinking about adding other factors, do you think that ESG issues are currently a factor or could become a factor in coming years as investors increasingly focus on ESG risks? Uh, great questions. Um, so let me first start off by saying, look, I'm just focusing on quality and defensive. But clearly, there's lots of other factors. Um, you know, uh, it, it, at AQR, we use, you know, uh, many different factors and different flavors of, of, of similar themes. Um, so they involve things like momentum and liquidity and size and, well, not so much size, but let's say liquidity, momentum, uh, value, defensive, quality. 
uh, carry factors, which is more of a macro concept, but can be applied as well to equities, all kinds of different factors. And in fact, my quantitative course really runs through the literature and all the tests and all the different things that, that, that have identified these factors. So for sure, there's lots of factors out there. Uh, the second part of that question on ESG, that's a really interesting one. Um, ESG, though, is a factor in the sense of it's an exposure that many clients and many investors care about. It's not necessarily, well, in fact, you would expect it wouldn't be something that would generate excess returns. In fact, if anything, you would think it would have poor excess returns because it's a constraint. In other words, you know, just theoretically, what you would say is, hey, look, if I'm allowed to invest in every security in the economy, that's a better set of opportunities than if you say I can't invest in these particular uh, companies or these particular industries because they pollute too much or because they do these other, other things. So just from that standpoint, if you limit your options, you should do worse. That's just, the, you know, that's, that's what constraints do to any optimization. Having said that, there is a larger debate on whether or not people or the markets are pricing ESG properly. So one argument, which I'm sympathetic to, is yes, it might be the case in the short run, you know, um, ESG type firms are not properly priced because people are underestimating the long-term risks if we don't get serious about climate change, if we don't do these other things. In that case, from a long-term investment perspective, they may be good ideas. But this is a debate. There's, there's the evidence isn't really there yet, one way or the other. And you know, I'm proud to say that we have a course in the master's program titled ESG Investing. It is run by Marina Neissner, uh, who's a professor here at Yale and also had, had spent some time at AQR, and Lukasz Pomorski, who is the head of ESG research at AQR Capital. And again, they're going to combine, and, and a former academic himself, they're going to combine the academic work on ESG investing with some of the things that are going on in practice and discuss these issues. And I think one of the most exciting areas of this is using big data and other interesting concepts to measure exposure of ESG. Environmental exposure is getting easier to measure. We're looking at carbon footprints and all kinds of other stuff. Um, governance, we've been able to measure for a long time. The really hard part is the social component. That's becoming a bigger component. And that's something that, you know, um, we're keenly interested in. So I'm quite excited that we're one of the few programs that can offer a, an entire course just on that from two of the leading scholars in that, in that field. So great question. And again, not all the answers have been decided yet. And I think they're going to do, I've seen their syllabus, they're teaching it this spring. So those of you that are currently at SOM, you can take their course this spring. Um, it'll be the first time it's run. And, uh, you know, they'll get into these issues. And I think it'll be a really, really interesting class. Great. So one other uh, question we've had that pertains really to both parts of your presentation, to the, the quality value piece, as well as to the, baiting, uh, the betting against beta piece. So obviously, as you know, researchers have shown that once these factors have been researched and uh, published in particular, once the research is out there in the journals, that a lot of times the excess returns to these factors get arbitraged away and disappear. And what do you think of this view with regard to uh, quality and defensive and with regard to betting against beta? So it's, it's a great question. Well, first of all, I would say the, the evidence that once these things are published, they disappear is flimsy at best. There's, there's debate on that. Um, and the reason why is let's take defensive investing, for instance. Why hasn't that disappeared? Well, the only reason, the only way that these things disappear is if everybody tries to go on one side of it. So the way to think about all these factors is who's on the other side of them. For in, you know, and the reason I say that is because the only investment strategy all of us can hold at the same time is the market. Anything that deviates from the market has to be at the expense of somebody else. So for instance, if I want to be a value investor, it has to be the case that someone else like Arwin has to be willing to be a growth investor. Otherwise, I can't own the value. I can't get him to sell me the value stocks if he doesn't want to sell them to me, right? So there has to be someone on the other side. Now, uh, an anomaly or a factor will not disappear if there's a natural holder of the other side. So take betting against beta. If there are pension funds, mutual funds, endowments, and retail investors that cannot use leverage or cannot use it cheaply, they naturally can never hold the low beta stocks. Those low beta stocks are never going to appeal to them 
they're never going to want them. So even if they know that there's a premium to be had from buying low beta stocks and levering them up, it's too expensive for them to lever it up. So they're going to happily have to walk away from that, right? If you're an investor that can lever it up, like an AQR or a Bridgewater or BlackRock, well, then you will do it. And so the real question is, you know, are, are there enough AQRs and BlackRocks and, and Bridgewaters out there to make this premium disappear um, relative to are there enough retail, pension, and uh, mutual funds who are willing to hold the other side? And what we've seen over a very long history, because this was published in 1972, is that there is a natural hoarder of the other side, which is why the betting against beta premium, you know, is still going to always be there. Now, I want to I want to caution people though, because I think people have a misconception. They think that well, this betting against beta premium, if it's always there, it means you make money on it all the time. No, that's not true. Check out this last chart. So I get to throw in the only chart I didn't get to get to cover uh, from this question. But notice, none of these things are riskless profits. They face their own risks. So here's the betting against beta premium over time, okay, in, in blue. Notice you can lose money on it. Well, the question is, when do you lose money? You lose money precisely when the costs of borrowing are cheap, exactly when you would expect to. So when it's not expensive for even retail investors to lever up and, and do these things, they'll do it, and this premium will shrink. Okay, that's this red bar here, it's sort of measuring the negative of the, of the cost of borrowing. But when borrowing is really expensive, of course, the betting against beta premium will uh, increase even further. So it's all, there's always got to be a natural holder of the other side. And at least for a lot of these concepts, I believe that, you know, for every value investor, there is a growth investor. And there's a reason. Re, you know, lots of investors don't like value stocks. They're old technology stocks. They've been beaten up. They may be distressed. And there's a bunch of investors who just don't want to touch those stocks. They also have risk associated with it. So a firm like AQR, which is willing to buy those cheap stocks, we're willing to because we don't care that they're not exciting, uh, attractive stocks with good growth opportunities. We like them because they're cheap. We also are willing to take the risk associated with them. And you're seeing that risk right now. In the last three years, value investing has had the largest drawdown it has ever had in its history. So being a value investor in the last three years has been brutally, brutally tough, very tough. Warren Buffett's feeling it too. You have to be willing to weather that storm, and a lot of investors aren't. If you are, that's precisely why you get paid a premium in the long run. You have to be willing to suffer through those periods. And before anyone asks, gee, can you time those periods and avoid them? No, because if you could, no one would pay you to hold it. You almost think of it as like a form of insurance. You're holding a set of assets that a group of an, an sizable group in the market doesn't want to own. And as long as that's always true, the premium will be there. If, however, that changes, right? If suddenly people say, hey, I don't mind owning value stocks or I don't mind owning low beta stocks, well, then you're absolutely right. This stuff will disappear. But it takes that. And that will only happen if it's like, you know, if it's free money. If, hey, if you buy these stocks, you earn money without any risk. Well, everybody will jump on that. But the stuff we're talking about here, there's risk. There's costs. There's all kinds of things associated with it, which means not everybody is willing to or wants to jump in on this. And that's where you have this natural balance between these things. Okay. Just like, for instance, if we ever invent, you know, um, houses that can't be burned down, well, fire insurance will not be as expensive and people wouldn't require it. Right. So um, that would, the same thing would happen there. All right. So all good right. question. So we're, we're at about 1055. So I'm going to ask just uh, one last question here. And we had a couple of people who asked the related questions. You know, these models, of course, they're based on data that cover long periods of time. And some of our viewers have wondered, how do you see these models then? Do, do they work at all over a short period? For example, the next couple of weeks following the, the, the uh, post-election turmoil or the next, right. uh, say, six to nine months as we wait for a COVID vaccine. Do these models have anything to tell us in that short of a time period, or are they really meant if you're a, a Buffett investor, really a long-term investor? These, these models are all about long-term investing. And that's one of the things that I, I tell my students on day one in the quant course, which is, you know, if you're coming to my course to say, hey, I want to figure out what's going to happen next week, I can't tell you. I, I just can't tell you. I don't think anybody in the world can tell you, by the way. Um, I would say all of my smart colleagues at AQR, we employ uh, 67 PhDs in research. Uh, we would all agree we can't tell you what's going to happen next week. 
Uh, I can't even tell you what's going to happen tomorrow or even next year. What we can do is tilt the odds slightly in our favor over long periods of time and, and, and do it across tens of thousands of securities all over the world. The way to think about what we do as quantitative investors is it's a, think of it almost like you know you're, you have a you have a coin that's slightly biased, um, and it's you know suppose you 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 flip you flip heads 52% of the time and get tails 48% of the time. Well, if I only get to flip the coin once or twice, right, trying to predict what's going to happen tomorrow or the next week it's not going to work out very well, right? I mean, it, it's barely better than 50-50. But if you let me flip that coin 10,000 times and do it over and over again over many, many years, that's where it starts to add up considerably. And so, you know, the concepts that I'm talking about today and that I talk about in my course are really about that long-term investment. Now, having said that, are there things that people claim that they look at that can predict what happens next week and next year? Sure, they do. Uh, I'm skeptical. I think that is a much, much more challenging thing to do because in any short period of time, you have so much noise. It would be like saying, you know, if I flip the coin once, is it more likely to come up heads? You're barely better than 50-50 in guessing that. But if you flip it 10,000 times, you know you're going to get more heads than tails on that biased coin. So same kind of concept here. Um, and, you know, you will learn a there, there will be a few things that people have done that may have some short-term predictability, but for the majority of what we're going to try to do, just because it's much easier to do, is thinking about predicting these things for the long term. And that requires patience and discipline, um, but that pays off. That's how Warren Buffett made his money. And so that's primarily what we'll be talking about, because I think that's actually achievable. The other stuff is much, much harder. But fair question. All right. And on that note, thank you very much, Toby, for taking time from your busy schedule to uh, present some of your research and that of your colleagues uh, to our audience today. And now I'd like to turn it back to Emily Whitehouse uh, for just a few uh, closing notes. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Arwen. Uh, that concludes the presentation and the Q&A for today's masterclass. A very special thanks to Arwen Zeisler and Tobias Moskowitz for their time today. Thank you both gentlemen, appreciate it. Um, and to all of you, of course, for tuning in and for your thoughtful questions. We hope today's class has given everyone a sense of what a class at Yale SOM is like. Please continue checking back on our website for more exciting virtual events posted frequently, including more master classes on all manner of interesting topics delivered by our esteemed faculty. Um, as well as a number of admissions events. There were some admissions-based questions in the Q&A, which I did my best to answer for you there. Um, but we do have some great sessions, including some small group admissions Q&As, uh, namely one with myself and Arwen tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Eastern. Uh, thanks again, Toby and Arwen and all who joined. I wish you all the very best. Take care. Take care, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye everyone. Now. See you.